Okay, it's time for me to give you a bit of a breath from the depressing stuff. I think it'll be nice to pull back and just talk about how much work the world of Tsushima itself puts in to characterize Jin. It's rather relaxing. Before you know it, you've lost an hour just chilling out with your horse and riding along the landscape. You'll happen across smokestacks indicating people who need help, or maybe a little bird will guide you towards a collectible item. You don't spend half your time checking some mini-map in the corner of the screen. The guiding wind is always blowing in the general direction of your marked objective. A way we organically learn little things about our hero is his tendency to share his shower thoughts with us, or in this case, hot spring thoughts. In addition to getting a little bump to max health, we'll get to listen to a little tidbit regarding recent events, or maybe Maybe just hear about whatever thoughts calm Jin down. I could have saved my father. He isn't especially superstitious, as shown by side quests involving people mistaking common occurrences for yokai activity. However, Jin at least respects a lot of cultural mythology like the Inari shrines. And you should too, because you get to pet foxes and get upgrades, but mostly the fox thing. <laughs> Inari is the Shinto god of rice cultivation. He has shrines all over Japan, especially in agricultural areas, and it is believed that foxes are sacred messengers that convey the prayers made at his shrines. As an open-world collectible objective, pretty cool choice. There's even a quest where Jin finds destroyed shrines and slaughtered foxes, and protects the ancient tradition along with small animals with some Mongol butchery. Jin also expresses himself as a warrior poet, very literally, in photogenic nature spots. Here, the player chooses the three lines of a haiku inspired by the location, and the options vary from nihilistic and depressed to resilient and optimistic. You even get a complimentary headband to commemorate the poem and expand the fashion endgame. When you're away from all the fighting, the game can turn into this very meditative experience. Moments of quiet contemplation in the soul-searching journey of its main character. There isn't too much about Tsushima's open world that's especially innovative outside of its impressive visuals, but its strength is its persistent connection to the character through whom we experience it. A somewhat quiet but very significant point of Act 2 helps Jin close the book on his relationship with his dad and start a new chapter in the ghost story, when Shimura sends him to collect and wear the armor of the Sakai clan into battle. He comes home to his childhood caretaker and the sweetest old lady to ever live, Yuriko, who's overjoyed to see him. While Yuriko prepares the armor, Jin mentally prepares himself to wear it by meditating on his father's death in the Sakai cemetery. Kazumasa's death was a profoundly traumatizing experience for Jin. In his father's final moments, Jin was frozen in hiding while a gravely wounded Kazumasa begged for his son's help. Jin, help me. Prior to the battle at Komoda Beach, Jin was too frightened to wear the armor he watched his father die in. After his defeat by the Khan, a lost Jin searches for guidance, and the game implies he believes his father is a spirit embodied as the guiding wind. When he is once again faced with the challenge of properly representing his clan, Jin struggles to put on his father's mask, overcome by the same terror that conquered him as a boy. Eventually, his resolve to protect his home wins out, and Jin takes his first step towards mastering fear itself. You see these types of masks all throughout the game, called menpo, and they're an important component in traditional samurai armor. Their utility in battle was to show prestige or intimidate enemies, and they were delicately crafted to resemble scary demon faces or prominent, respectable features like bushy mustaches made of straw. Masks are a common visual element in Japanese storytelling, especially in media like No and other forms of theater, used to convey a character's way of presenting themselves to the world. Jin's new way is to teach the Mongol the same meaning his father's mask holds for him. Sure enough, in combat gameplay this armor does just that. In addition to enhancing the number of enemies Jin can take down in a proper samurai standoff to as many as five, there's a good chance that any remaining enemies will be terrified and either collapse in fear or run away from the fight. This is useful since by this point players may have unlocked the Ghost Stance, a powerful posture that strikes fear into enemies and grants up to three free violent insta-kills, though the stance is only accessed by killing several enemies in succession without taking any damage. Jin doubles down on the fear tactics mentality by insisting that Yuriko help him develop some poison, and reluctantly she helps him cross one more line. Hey, at least it's locally sourced and organic poison. I wouldn't exactly call it cruelty-free, though. 
In the process, Yuriko unwittingly reveals that Jin has far more in common with his father than just genetics, weapons, and armor. According to Yuriko, Shimura's incredibly hard line about tradition is at least in part a consequence of his witnessing the bloodthirsty actions of Kazumasa Sakai in the process of taming Tsushima. Side note, get a measuring cup, do Yuriko's extra quest, and let me know the total volume of the tears it pumped out of your eye holes. I needed a bigger cup. Yuriko, are you alright? It's nothing. Now, I would like to talk about a comparatively less cuddly grandmother, Lady Masako Adachi. Historically speaking, some women who married into or served under the samurai class were trained in combat and sometimes fought alongside male troops on the battlefield, called onabugeisha, or simply female martial artists. Famous examples include my history waifu, Tomoe Gozen, or simply Lady Tomoe, as well as Masako Hojo. I'm sure these historically famous names being used for characters in-game aren't deliberately specific references references or anything like that. In our Masako's case, she had demonstrated combat aptitude in a practical situation by fending off bandits and impressing an eligible samurai bachelor. During wartime, in the event that all the men in the family of fighting age were too busy being away in combat or dead, it often fell to women like these to keep their families safe. Unfortunately for Masako, on the eve of the invasion, someone close to the Adachi clan sold them out to assassins, who wiped out the whole family before Masako could do anything about it. In one night, her husbands and sons died on Komoda Beach, and by the next day, her grandchildren were slain too. Her quest line involves hunting down the conspirators who planned the attack on Masako's clan, and since the headspace she's in is not ideal for investigation or due process, Jin has to do a lot of mediating before some tight-lipped monks risk getting cut. It's in this story that we can see someone on a quest for revenge struggling not to buckle under the strain of her grief, and Masako's disgust and hatred intensifies as the traitors show they're willing to deceive and kill their own loved ones to protect themselves. While dealing with Masako might be a little challenging at times, there's quiet moments that do wonders to connect her and Jin's stories and convey the depth of their shared loss. Thank you. The best example is when they walk the beach together, looking for the bodies of her sons amid dozens of other slain samurai, and finding a suitable place to bury them. You have been a great friend, Jean Sakai. It takes everything Masako has to keep from losing herself, and when she finally reaches her breaking point, it gets ugly. Jin has grown enough to show her that she doesn't have to fight the whole world and suffer all alone to honor her family. Masako's story is emblematic of the great loss and resulting despair that Jin experiences in the beginning of the story, and the temptation to give in to hatred and punish as much of the world as possible. I wanted to die with them. I threw myself into a battle I knew I couldn't win. It was... easier. Together, they come to understand that even after losing everything, there's reasons to hold on. When Masako's enemy is the last person she expects, and the moment to claim justice is at hand, she takes her first step on the path to finding some kind of peace. This path does not lead to peace. Where does it lead? I don't know. I have to continue walking it to find out. Before we get to peace, though, we've got a bit of a war to fight. And there's enough combat in this game that it's worth spending time on how it conveys Jin's transformation organically as you play. Jin starts the game as a well-trained but untested samurai. He can fight undisciplined bandits and Mongols alike with comparative grace and poise, but it'll take time, experience, and a little tactical flexibility from the dark side of the samurai force to become more ghostly. Where his samurai skills fail him, Jin resorts to raw stealth techniques that grow significantly more refined with investment from the player. Stealth kills start out noisy with clumsy animation, and in the case of some enemies might not even successfully kill them. However, as Jin's lethality increases, the animations become quieter and more efficient, and you can silently slice through small groups of enemies after jumping off a roof, like the homicidal weeaboo you never knew you wanted to be. If I'm being honest with myself, 
The stealth gameplay isn't especially innovative compared to contemporary stealth games with more novel mechanics, but it's a fine dance partner to the combat. In the deadly tango through Mongol ranks, both aspects of gameplay comfortably pass the lead off to each other. Even with a growing roster of sneaky tactics like throwing knives and explosives, the samurai side of Jin competently keeps pace with the ghost. The game has a selection of beautifully detailed armor to accommodate different kinds of samurai people might like to play, from an unassuming wandering swordsman with a big hat to an imposing and colorfully armored lord with a big hat. Smash through guards with the power of cool armor and aggressively hammer mongs into the ground, or even kill like five dudes in as many hits in a standoff. Standoffs are the coolest samurai technique, as well as my favorite thing in the game in general. They never get old. It's like a game of chicken, but with swords. <laughs> There's a couple minor quest lines about learning the secrets of legendary swordsmen and incorporating them into Jin's repertoire as well. The highlights include an elegant finisher in the Heavenly Flash, or a stylish triple attack in the Dance of Wrath, which is useful on a single beefy enemy, but also handy on as many as three targets. Bonus points if you set Jin's sword on fire too. As the game wears on, attacks gain a layer of vicious cruelty to reflect the nature of the ghost. Finishing moves go from clean single cuts or stabs to occasionally including a dismemberment or decapitation, especially in the ghost stance kills. All of these gameplay elements harmonize to serve as a compelling companion to a story about becoming a new and terrifying kind of warrior, in addition to serving as an effective samurai fantasy. I just realized I neglected to mention that bows are an option in combat, I guess, if you feel like it or something. There's explosive arrows, that's pretty cool. Uh, in, in all seriousness, they're fine, and Sensei Ishikawa's storyline serves to improve them further in addition to providing an interesting counterpoint in the story's perception of honor and its parallels with struggling parent-child dynamics. Ishikawa is most succinctly described as the grumpy martial arts master with a mysterious past. You're the best archer we've ever had. Yeah, not even close. His way of the bow is a legend in its own right, but he isn't known for his light touch or teaching many people. You don't get a name like the Demon Sensei for giving out candy, hugs, or positive reinforcement. He missed Komoda Beach on account of a severe falling out with his latest student, Tomoe, and with her subsequent disappearance, most of Ishikawa's storyline is about finding out why. Upon discovering that Tomoe seemingly defected to the Mongols, Ishikawa behaves like he didn't think of her as a daughter just a few days prior to the story. Jin inadvertently becomes Tomoe's replacement, and Ishikawa quickly proves his reputation as a harsh teacher. You said the only way up was to climb. No. I said you had to climb. To be painfully accurate. While his lessons make some sense in terms of practical concept, it's a bit uncool to let his student get ambushed and not offer them any help fighting off a dozen Mongols. Oh, help. I suppose getting perforated builds character. I can see why Tomoe attacked you. <laughs> We learn more about Ishikawa and Tomoe as we follow her trail, and her methodology is just as cold and efficient as her teachers. Her improvements to Mongolian archery techniques help make archers even more annoying, especially since you fight a billion of them in this particular story. Ishikawa is a substantially more pragmatic samurai than Shimura, and more accepting of the tactics employed by the ghost, but that's not always a good thing outside gameplay convenience. He's willing to endanger innocent civilians for the sake of success, to the point he suggests sacrificing a well-populated town that also happens to be the one he lives in and ostensibly protects. Totally worth it in his eyes, as long as he'd catch Tomoe in exchange. Jin argues against him in a way that distantly echoes his uncle, and it likely doesn't come as a surprise that Ishikawa has a secret history of unintentionally feeding the inner darkness of his past students. Once Jin finally catches up to Tomoe, we get a bit more of her side of the story. While she's no angel and has absolutely made her own choices, added context makes more sense of her recent actions, and her goals are more compatible with Jin's than expected. When she offers to make amends by intercepting a Mongol raid on the seedy port town of Umugi Cove, Ishikawa and Jin are uncertain about her intentions. I'll position myself there. Then you...
What begins as a pretty cut and dry case of a bad egg turned rotten is more complicated in truth. Tomoe's achievements and progress were never enough for Ishikawa, and under ceaseless pressure, she cracked, only to show her teacher the extent of her capabilities as an adversary. When all is said and done, Ishikawa is humbled by a change of heart towards his student. He reflects on his role as a teacher and as an adoptive father, and his ultimate lesson is his failures in these roles. I have no more lessons to give in this life, except one. Promise me, you won't repeat my mistakes. You've probably already guessed that Tomoe and Ishikawa's story is reflective of Jin's failing relationship with his uncle Shimura, and seeing a similar situation from the outside helps flesh out the main ideological conflict of the game. The player and Jin's understanding of the perspective of both sides and the fractured love that still connects them makes answering the questions the story poses far more difficult, and I mean that in the best way. By the end of the game, Jin has been through quite a lot, and by the end of this video, you've probably been through a lot of me talking. We followed the transformation of a broken man into a larger-than-life mythical warrior, but what's the big payoff at the end? The final resolution to Jin's inner struggle comes in a form you might have expected from the middle of the game or so, facing Uncle Shimura. I really, really don't want to spoil much beyond that, but the atmosphere is heavy with inevitability, as every action both men have taken throughout the story has brought them to where they stand at the end. Neither will apologize for who they are. The consequences of Jin's actions reach so much further than he could have anticipated. How Jin faces this final dilemma, like most of his struggles throughout the game, falls squarely into the player's hands, and there isn't an easy answer to the question the finale asks honor tradition and show that even a dishonored samurai still lives by a code or embrace the ghost and resolve to give honor new meaning in an ever-changing world. In a storm of white and red petals, death dances with life in ceaseless, swirling patterns at the whim of the wind. With his answer given, Jin Sakai faces the uncertain future no longer as a man, but as something more. Now, he is the ghost. The ghost of Tsushima.